Good day, everyone. I'm Jack, and the kind introduction um, suggested that. And yes, my nan was a bit of a legend, and I'd, I thought about scrapping this whole talk and just talking about her for, for the entire time, because it would be far more um, enjoyable. Um, this was said by a mate um, some time back, <laughs> and so you might gather that and um, I guess just get used to it a little bit. But um, there are times where I'm not so dry. Um, <laughs> I tend to get caught in these moments um, on shoots, and you know, as a, as a business owner of a small studio, you um, conceive a shoot, you um, sell it to the client, you organise the team, you art direct it on the day, and then you end up as the spritz boy. Um, this is pre-COVID, you wouldn't do this in a shoot now. Um, any sort of spraying water is a bit of a no-no. Um, so I run a small branding studio called Motherbird. Um, it was formed with uh, two close friends straight out of university. So basically everything that I know about design I've had to learn on the go, which has its, has its positives because you um, it's sort of rewarding when things go your way, but it also um, has its negatives when you're just guessing the whole time. Um, and I also run a platform, creative writing platform called Wordform that asks creatives to write about words in a, uh, write about a particular word um, from the perspective of their personal and professional lives. I'll touch on that a bit later. Here's some of, there's my spritzing work. It might not actually show on the screen, but I was a pretty good spritz boy. Um, so our work's pretty, pretty diverse. We don't specialise um, in any particular industry, which we quite like. It keeps things pretty new. Um, we work for big, big clients, small clients, um, you know, startup, new clients, old clients. Um, we just like to work for people doing good things. Um, so you'll see there's a lot of colourful work, there's a lot of bright work. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the, the actual work today. Um, what I want to talk about is th three things. Uh, purpose, process and practice. And particularly probably narrowing in on purpose and process. So the last, um, the last two years, and I think probably a lot of us have sort of felt this, I don't know whether it's burnout or, or um, just lack of purpose or drive or motivation or inspiration. Um, and so I really want to delve into that. Um, I mean, it's, it's probably a bit of a therapy session for myself up here, but I'm sure a lot of people can sort of relate to this story as well. So we'll start with purpose. So why are you all here? We're all here for, for something, right? Um, but it's interesting, I often think to myself, what, why did I do something so stupid that I decided to become a designer? And this often goes through my head, and you know, some of my friends are working nine to five jobs, they, they rock up on time, they clock off on time, then they can go to the gym, look after the family, whatever it might be, um, do their washing at midday, whatever, whatever they're doing. And, you know, we're all sitting there at 2 a.m. trying to figure out how big the client means when they say, make the logo bigger. <laughs> this is a common one. You thought you could save the world, you know, with design. And I sort of thought that as well. Or you wanted to explore this gift that you have that everyone's told you since you were young. You know, you're a, you're a good little drawer. <laughs> or you wanted to get paid to follow your dreams. Um, <laughs> This is one of my favourite gifts of all time. <laughs> but when we break that down, and you know, maybe you didn't want to save the world, but you, know, you wanted to leave a meaningful difference or make it a better place, and that to me translates to hope. Um, you know, exploring your creativity and um, I guess the, the skill set that you have and pushing the boundaries of, of your thought process in the brain, you know, challenging yourself, that's curiosity. And then sort of working for, you know, at times less than a lot of the people you know or working longer hours or whatever it might be because you feel truly um, you, you love something so much, then that's passion. So we're all here for similar reasons and I imagine a lot of you are here for some of those reasons or other reasons and we've all come here in different ways. Um, for me, this was the start of my graphic design career and I didn't draw that, that's a Da Vinci if, if I drew that, I wouldn't be talking about graphic design. Um, this was in high school. I had to draw this crop of baby Jesus. Um, 
I don't know why I chose that. There's much easier things to draw, but I thought that, like, it's just, it's just a baby. It can't be that hard. But I really struggled to get the skin tone right, and I, saw, I drew something that looked like that. <laughs> and my art teacher at the time came over and said to me, um, you know, have you heard of this? Have you heard of graphic design? And <laughs> I thought she sort of saw something in me that, you know, he likes computers and, you know, he's pretty artistic. And I think she just wanted me the fuck out of the class. <laughs> so I said no. And she said, it's this thing where you can create cool art on computers. And I couldn't believe it. And I thought, that, that's exactly what I want to do. Around the same time, we had these careers counselor sort of things come in and they go through all these questions and then they come up with what you'd be good at. And I got journalism and, and I was like, Wait, what about that art computer thing? Like, that sounds cool. And, um, and I th looking back on it, you know, I do write a lot now and actually it probably would have been a decent sort of direction, but I didn't take too much notice of it because the guy next to me, they said he would be a good yabby farmer, which, <laughs> like, not Fisher, not... Farmer, yabby farmer, which is very specific. So I sort of threw that advice in the bin and followed graphic design. But in truth, I wanted to be like my dad. Um, that's him in the middle there with my brother, uh, who's also a graphic designer. Um, he's very good. I can't even hire him. It's impossible. He won't work for me. Um, and so dad's an industrial designer. And he designed some of these things back in the 90s, um, which you might be familiar with the mop bucket on the left. Very old design, but many of you might have had it in your household. Um, and the Axis kettle on the right, which has incredible environmental properties. Um, it's quite groundbreaking at the time, but also goes on an axis. So, you know, kettles where you used to have to put it on one point, and that was the point you had to put it on. Now you can sort of swivel it around. He was doing all this amazing stuff, and I was so inspired, and we'd always be drawing 3D stuff and all that sort of stuff. And at the same time, I'd, I'd done this. <laughs> I drew Gollum Jesus. And my design career was born. <laughs> Some say the talent was passed down, but we'll never know. And I got told this, Jack asked too many questions, and it's sort of been a theme through uh, the conference of being inquisitive, curious, and asking questions. And I thought it was weird being told you asked too many questions, because how many questions you know, can you ask until it's wrong or right, or what's the right amount of questions? And maybe I was obsessed with this you know, perfect certainty or whatever it might be, which is really hard in graphic design or any sort of design, because a lot of it is perceived as subjective. While there's, while there's a lot of science and um, psychology and all that sort of stuff around design actually having um, some scientific merit, um, it's largely perceived as um, subject, uh, subjective. Um, so I, I believe that you know, if, you, if you stop having questions, you'll stop having answers. And, um, this is something that comes naturally to me. I ask a lot of questions, and I'm sure a lot of you do as well. It's important to poke and prod the world and find out what it is and where you sort of fit in it and how you can change it into a better place. Because that's, I guess, I, that's probably what I feel like my purpose is, is to make the place a little more interesting, however that might be. But through this, the last few years, I've felt like I've lost my purpose. Like I've I've been searching for it everywhere, wondering where the hell it's gone, sitting at home sort of working each day during COVID. And I feel like it was taken by my lack of process. So doing the things that I used to do all the time, going into work, even getting coffee, smelling this, doing that, um, that all gets sort of taken away and you sort of lose a bit of purpose. Like, why are we doing all of this? Because we're missing all of the, the nice bits of, of life. By the way, I should clarify I'm from Melbourne, so we were locked down a lot. Um, so a big part of this talk, hopefully people can, um, or you know, you guys can, I guess, get a bit out of it and, and think that if you do have a lack of purpose, intent, curiosity, whatever that might be for periods, then that does happen and that's okay. So digging a little deeper into purpose uh, process. So naturally, as I do, I asked questions and the strategists in the room are probably like, I didn't do this the right way and I didn't, I went to Instagram. But um, we're just going to have to deal with that. So I asked, did the pandemic stifle your creativity? And 60% of people said yes, which um, is you know, not, not surprising. But then when asked, has it now returned, 67% um, of people said no, which means 
roughly 40%, actually, I think, I think it's precisely 40% of people still, or designers, creatives, still don't feel quite right. So it shows how important the creative process is to what we do and you know, how we feel about um, our vocation. So I want to delve into two broad ideas that I believe help the creative process flourish. And the first one's getting out, so escaping your own thoughts. And the second one is getting lost, so that's immersing yourself deeply in the process. So we'll start with getting out. See, this is why I have so many slides, because they actually sort of do all sorts of things. <laughs> um, I believe that you don't run out of ideas, you run out of ways to find them. And I guess the question is then, how do you find ideas? For me, ideas come from experiences and moments, all those, all those little bits in your life, those stories, the good, the bad, the, your background, whatever that might be. And a lot of the talks have focused on the, the value of you know, channeling, channeling who you are to tell your story. And everyone's is slightly different. And then styles come from inspiration and experimentation for, for the most part. So these past experiences that we all have that make up who we are, then collide with how we're presently thinking, and then in the, in the middle, the ideas are formed. So this is an ever-moving thing. The way that you presently think is always sort of changing and looking back on past experiences in different ways, hence forming new ideas. The problem is, the last couple of years, we've had fear, death, loneliness, uncertainty, all of that bad news, um, sickness, illness, all, all of that sort of stuff. So being a creative in that space is quite challenging to have great experiences that you can pull from and then, and then create great ideas. This word often seems quite big, um, and I'd hate to say it's simple because there's probably a lot of neuroscientists out there going, mate, it's fucking really complex. But if we break it down, I think this is a really important part of the creative process, is your brain temporarily slowing in the front part of your brain. So when that happens, um, the front part of the brain down-regulates and basically your brain finds new pathways. But they, they used to think that it was mainly in people with schizophrenia or any sort of addiction, um, compulsion, but they've more recently found that it's quite, quite key to creative thinking. So basically your brain, um, usually when you're you know, doing emails and doing all that sort of stuff, you have this cognitive thought of all of these um, neurons passing through your brain through the between the shortest possible distances. When that slows down, it finds new ways to go. So you think about closing a highway or something, everyone's driving down dirt roads and different things and having new experiences, the brain's no different to that. And that's sort of how the creative thinking works and you're probably wondering what relevance that is, but most of the ideas that I imagine that everyone comes up with might be in the shower or when they're lying in bed or they're going for a walk. It's not necessarily sitting at your desk um, trying to smash out or brainstorm something. And when we think about, this is specific to me and maybe several out there, but um, when we think about doing and being in a studio or whatever it might be, um, you're surrounded by all this beautiful thinking space, going home, going to the park, doing all of that sort of stuff and um, letting ideas breathe because that outside world helps impact what you're doing at work. And then during that, this whole, the last couple of years, this is what I've felt, that that whole outside world dramatically shrunk which means you don't have space for those ideas to sort of, um, you know, sit in a big stew and, um, and, and create and change flavours and, and all of that sort of stuff. And I was trying to create spaces to think during the pandemic, but just didn't have the, the, mental, um, the mental strength to sort of get myself out and do a lot of those type of things. And it was always something that I suspected. So I've talked about this stuff before. And it's always something that I suspected and that I've read and whatnot. And it wasn't until it actually happened to me, I realized I was a walking case study for it. So this question got asked, and most people do their creative thinking elsewhere, which I imagine um, a lot of you do as well. So it's not really a surprise. Because the creative process, you know, a lot of people outside the design industry might think it looks like this, but in reality, it's more like this, and we need to create spaces for that middle area to be going up and down and backwards and forwards and cutting it off and linking it again and whatever that might be. So the next one, getting lost. And 
This is a topic you're all probably pretty familiar with, but the idea of flow, and flow is a byproduct of transient hypofrontality when the brain slows down and you have complete focus um, and devotion to a single task. Um, if there's any musicians out there, any rock climbers, anyone that is doing something that requires, uh, you get lost in it and immersed in it, and we get that in the creative industry as well. It's being one with, one with your thoughts and you know, hours disappear and then suddenly it's, it's you know, dark outside or it's morning again or whatever that might be. Um, he's in flow right now, I imagine. Um, and that, that flow channel sits between something that's too difficult that it, it stresses you out and something that's too easy that um, it makes you bored. So it's that real, that, that middle area that's got a really nice, nice um, spot where you just feel completely challenged but um, able to do something. So flow can happen at work or home. I don't know what you guys prefer. I hate working at home. Um, I, procrastinate too much um, and, and definitely need people around me. This was encouraging. Um, when, design, when people get designer's block, you know, do they have a way out? A lot of people do. Um, I haven't delved into what people do, um, but I'll sh sort of share what I usually rely on. So firstly, I like to observe, um, and I think this is the last question that I asked. Um, how do people recharge their batteries? So a lot of people are inspired by other work. They just get going and get into it and look at other people's creativity, and, it, and it, then it inspires them. And I think something like this coming together is a real testament to that. Um, when I'm working on a project, I find tuning out is just the, the best thing to get away from it and let the idea sort of um, flourish and uh, find its own way back to me. There's this concept called actively noticing, um, which was coined by, or created, I suppose, by psychologist Ellen Langer, um, which is, I guess, sh should be sort of the mother of mindfulness. So this is a very much the basis of mindfulness, but it's really tasting that apple that you bite or smelling, smelling a, a smell with all of your senses, feeling the wind on your face. So it's being incredibly, um, incredibly active in, in what you do notice of the world around you. And um, this next, I, want, I actually want to play a bit of a song. Um, I'm not singing, I'm terrible. Um, but it's a song by King Creosote and John Hopkins. And I, I'd heard it a lot before, but it wasn't until um, when I was missing all of these moments that are in this song that it hit me the hardest. And I realized that these little things in life um, are really important to the makeup of who we are and then how we generate ideas. So I'm going to ask you all to close your eyes for not too long, I'm not going to play the whole thing, um, but yeah, let's give it a go. All right, that's probably enough. Sorry, I just woke you all from your meditation, like that bell. You know when you're meditating and that bell comes on and it just scares the shit out of you? Um, I put this up to lighten the mood again. It's a pug, you know, launching at an exercise ball at full speed. I think this pug does it a bit, so it, it's unharmed, but a um, bit of an idiot. But you can sort of get those sounds that, um, 
you know, particularly when they're taken away in that external world that might, it does for me, that inspires me. And they're tiny little things that you don't think that you miss until you do, and then you realise that they're very important to the makeup of, of how you go about things. So the next thing is connecting. And, you know, that leads back to people. I mean, you know, do you guys work alone? Are you surrounded by people? Do you like people? Are you people people? Bloody people. You know, we're phone starers, cigarette tossers, plane recliners, pocket dialers, horn honkers, convo stoppers, meeting misses, cue cutters, slow walkers, debt dodgers, flat earthers. I'm sounding a lot like this guy. <laughs> but on the flip side of that, we're all also storytellers, brain engagers. Thought leaders, problem solvers, trailblazers, mind benders, li intent listeners, soul lighters, risk takers, love makers, smile creators. And when asked that question, do you require human connection to creatively thrive? 74% of people said yes. So it turns out I actually need all you, um, and you need me too. And the third thing that I like to do to get out of creative ruts or keep myself creatively going for work projects or um, you know, stay motivated is to express. And um, touching on that journalism thing before, I've always written. I used to write a lot of lyrics. I used to write um, poems and whatnot. And I've, I've found that that is really helps me express who I am. And a lot of people might paint, they might draw, they might run, they, whatever that is. They might play sport, they might play an instrument. For me, I, I guess I design words. Um, so these are some of the things that I've been working on the last few years, just figuring out how language works and responds to different things. Um, I clearly like Eve Klein Blue. I once um, bought a piece of Eve Klein Blue paper and framed it. Um, and yeah, they really keep me going. And I've been exploring with projection how, how surfaces uh, respond to different things and then working the words back into those um, and hopefully get these moving in some capacity in one day and turn them into some sort of light show thing um, or something, I don't know. But um, it sort of keeps me motivated along the way. Another project that I've worked on that I absolutely love and started a number of years ago and have sort of put it on hold during the last few years, but looking to start it up again is word form, which I touched on earlier. And on the left-hand side is, are all these amazing themes that all these brilliant people have, have written about. And um, these are the type of projects that I really like because they, it's almost like a curveball type of thing. They're not the standard design questions that people get asked about process and anything like that. They've got to write about humility or pleasure or courage or ego. And some of the responses on there are just truly amazing. And um, like Kevin was talking about, just humbled to even have some of those names writing. And a lot of them have, speak, have spoken at, at this conference as well. So going back to that um, idea, you don't run out of ideas, you run out of uh, ways to find them. I think I, the last couple of years, I've stopped doing the things that work for me a fair bit. So. Um, I think it's really important that, personally, I get back to those um, because I know what works for me now, having gone through that. And I'll touch on you know, what might work for you guys moving forward a bit later. And the third thing that I want to talk about is practice. And I, I really don't want to go too much into each of the projects, but I've got three projects that I want to share a couple of images on and just sort of say why, why I liked what I loved about the project, and I don't think, um, I think all of these sort of fit in that flow channel that I was talking about. They all had a really good process and a great journey along the way, which makes the end product fulfilling. And, you know, work is, producing amazing work um, is always the goal and, and to make a difference, but if you're not enjoying it along the way, um, then it, it sort of becomes meaningless and you, you lose that purpose. So I think for these, particular projects I um, have really gravitated towards. Oops, that's a laser pointer. Um, so firstly, I just want to talk about the progress principle. And the whole talk comes back to this idea of enjoying the process along the way. Um, you know, pleasure makes, our uh, pleasure comes from the journey, not the, not the end destination. And, um, Shakespeare said, uh, things one are done, uh, joy lies in, 
Uh, Joy's soul lies in the doing. And if you think about any of those, you know, amazing projects that you might have worked on, you, you could enter it into an award show and it gets some recognition or um, get some comments online or people go, that's great. Um, but it's always, it's always the fondness of a project of, of that process along the way. So this project um, is called Hey Tomorrow. Um, it's high quality boxed wine. Uh, yes, you heard me, good goon. Um, and the thing that excited me about this was changing the, uh, changing the narrative from guys like this, liking Goon, to this guy who, incredible pixels there, but um, he can apparently smell by blocking his ear. Um, I don't know that's like when you're driving, trying to find a park, and you, you have to turn down the music, which makes no sense. Um, so what I loved about this project is we had to change perceptions, long negative perceptions of box wine. I love that the concept, while old, um, has a new spin on it. Um, it's not only from the box itself, but um, from the way that it's presented. I loved how much the client trusted us. They had so much of their own money in this, and they just deferred to us all of the time while challenging us as well. So that always makes a project enjoyable. I love being involved from the big like the beginning of the project, from the naming all the way through to the packaging and design. It's always fulfilling when you've, when you've got your hands on a lot of the project. I loved art directing shoots because you can't hide anywhere on, on a shoot. If you stuff it up, that's it. And that's the same with up here now. Um, you sort of get one shot at it, and I sort of thrive in that, that um, adrenaline-based scenario where you, it sort of... Um, you know, sink or swim type of thing. Um, we didn't spritz anywhere, um, but we did spill a lot of wine. Um, I love the environmental credentials of box wine. You're probably going, what? There's a bladder in there. Um, but the CO2 emissions from bottles are, I learned, apparently absolutely terrible. So you'll see a lot of companies using cans and little packages and all sorts of stuff now to reduce that. So that was really attractive for the process and working on a client attempting to do something different. I love that in lockdown we consume copious amounts of box wine. And box wine, I don't know if you all know, but it keeps for 30 days once you open it, um, which is really attractive because you're like, I don't have to throw the bottle out or drink the bottle, but I just drink the whole cask. So it, <laughs> it wasn't actually of benefit to me, um, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Um, Bonsoy is a um, pretty well-known Australian soy milk company who, um, I guess a lot of people think they're a big conglomerate, but they're actually a family-owned business. Um, but they came to us with the, the uh, wanting to do a website, and we, we said, well, hang on, you don't really have a brand. You've got, you've got an iconic package, um, but we really need to address the brand. So I love that we challenged the challenge of respecting the past while sort of moving into the future. So we established there were three main things in their packaging, brand mark, color, and line work, and then we implemented that through the brand, trying to, you know, when you're in a cafe and you see the Bonsoi boxes up there, so we've really tried to get this repetitive thing going so it feels like it would look in a cafe. Again, I love being part of the project from start to finish, um, always really rewarding. We worked with Apostrophe on the copy of this, which was so much fun. And I love when the client grabs your work and does their own thing. They made these little Instagram stickers, which are really cool and fun, and it's always surprising when your work is, um, gets a life of its own again, and it's not just your hands on it, when people can grab it and use it, and ad agencies have used it and rolled it out in new ad campaigns at the moment, which um, it's great to see how it works. There are fanboys with bonsoi tattoos on them. Um, so the amount of uh, pressure to not fuck the brand up um, for all of the fanboys out there and fangirls was, um, was a pretty heavy task, which I absolutely loved. I love being playful and irreverent. And I do love that they're a family-owned business as well. Now, this project I'll touch on quickly is probably my favorite project we've ever done, actually. Um, they're a creative content agency based in, in London, and they gave us the brief of rebranding them. But we figured their name didn't mean anything, and it also meant everything at the same time. Um, and I love that we decided the name didn't matter and we 
deleted it, and they bought it. And I love that by censoring the name, in context, the reader actually has to say the name, which makes it more powerful than the logo anyway. <laughs> and I love the fact that we sold it by, by um, basically pulling up Don Draper's Heinz ad where he convinces the, he the Heinz client that they don't actually need the logo in there. And he talks about, he says, the greatest thing you uh, you have working for you is not the photo or the uh, the photo you take or the picture you paint. It's the imagination of the consumer. They have no budget. They have no time limit. And if you can get in that space, you can run all day. I love the flexibility of the copy. And I love being able to put my own copy spin on things as well and sort of write whatever I wanted to write. And again, I love when the client makes films out of things and um, and uses the brand. I love working with other creatives where bad design can't hide, so they're creative as well, so when they see something they don't like, they'll tell you and they'll have good reason, um, which, is, which is always a lot of pressure, but always really rewarding. And I love that, and because of that, the original pitch that we put together for them, they came back and said, this is way off the mark. And so we went back and we gave them something to think about. And I really love that this was the, our intro slide to the presentation. So you're probably thinking, oh, fuck, where does this leave me? And I think it's really important to find your own process. So I talked about things that have worked for me in the past, and everyone will have different things, but it's important to find what your process is and what works for you. And I think with this whole working from home thing, there's different things that work for different people, but it's important to find out what works for you, not, not others. It's important not to rush the process as well. Let transient hyperfrontality take its place come up with an idea, leave it for two weeks if you have time. We try and do that in the studio, but don't rush the process, don't force it, trust it, and the idea will come back to you. Get out and get lost, so get out of your own head and then get lost in it. Enjoy the journey. Um, as I've touched on a few times, the, the process is 90% of what we do. Um, the 10% the is you know, the really rewarding bit, but it's that journey that you know, we really want to enjoy to make it worthwhile and give us purpose. And then make it meaningful. This has been touched on a fair bit through the conference, but we're in a pretty extraordinary industry where we have the ability to influence and change people, people's lives, opinions, um, quality of life at scale. So with that comes great responsibility. So be purposeful about how you use it. Thank you.